In this episode, I host a dialogue between Tibetologist and Tantric Buddhist Lama Glenn Mullen, and Doctor of Tibetan Medicine and Spiritual Teacher of the Utok Nyinti lineage Dr. Nida Chenak Sang. Lama Glenn and Dr. Nida discuss the impact of three revolutionary figures in Tibetan Buddhism from historical and doctrinal perspectives Padmasambhava, Atisha, and Tsongkhapa. The discussion extends to include the history and evolution of the famous Six Yogas of Naropa. Both Lama Glenn and Dr. Nida are known to teach these hitherto secretive practices relatively openly, and they discuss the issues that have influenced them to do so, including prophecy, the true meaning of secrecy, and the importance of including the body in religious practice. Lama Glenn and Dr. Nida also discuss subjects such as the geomancy of Samye and the surrounding areas the pros and cons of the multiplicity of religious sects in Tibet, similarities between Buddhist lineages and Western psychological schools, and more. So without further ado, Lama Glenn Mullen and Dr. Nida Chenak Tsang. Lama Glenn Mullen and Dr. Nida Chenak Tsang, welcome to the podcast. Lotus all to the Jay, thank you all. Yeah, as I was saying before we began, the recording. I'm so excited for this dialogue. And uh, thank you both so much for being willing to come together and, and, and talk here. Well, let's get straight to it. Um, it's said that there was electric guitar before Jimi Hendrix. And there was electric guitar after Jimi Hendrix. And what's meant by that, of course, is that Jimi Hendrix, his impact on the world of guitar playing uh, on several fronts was so it was so revolutionary, that it changed the course of of, of guitar playing, and you couldn't really not reference him after um, after he'd 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 been, and you know I was thinking about six yogas and how how we might begin our discussion of that, and a, a figure in the history of Tibetan Buddhism who you know in a way I don't know if this is a sacrilegious dis- uh, comparison could be described a little bit like that is J Tsongkhapa, the twelfth thirteenth century. Um, monk, philosopher, and, and yogi. And, you know, his writings hugely influential. And one could say that there was Tibetan Buddhism before Tsongkhapa and Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism after Tsongkhapa. Maybe that's, maybe that's wrong. Maybe you'll correct me on that. Um, I think that argument could be made. And Tsongkhapa wrote on many things, many subjects, one of which being um, our topic for today, or at least our starting topic, the six yogas of Naropa in works such as the uh, Book of Three Inspirations, which Glenn, you yourself translated in your book, Six Yogas of Naropa. And Dr. Nida, I know you're also an admirer. I've heard you speak positively of Tsongkhapa's presentation of the Six Yogas also. So I know you're both admirers of him. And so I thought it might be interesting to start there. Do you agree that with what I'm saying that there's Tibetan Buddhism before Tsongkhapa and Tibetan Buddhism after Tsongkhapa? If so, could you say something about that? If not, could you refute that? Um, and, you know, this is this is an access point. <laughs> okay, really. sure. More, the last thing I'll say is that this is an access point to a more broad question, which is okay. how have the six yogas changed uh, and iterated over the um, over the centuries? So, just to break the ice, I'll throw in a couple of reflections on that point. In the Tibetan Buddhist world, they talk about three befores and afters, three great figures before and after. There's Tibetan Buddhism before Padmasambhava and Tibetan Buddhism after Padmasambhava. So we often hear it said Padmasambhava brought Buddhism to Tibet. Actually, Tibetan Buddhism had been the national religion of Tibet for over 150 years, not just a small little movement, the national religion. And so Buddhism was there for some hundreds of years before Padmasambhava, but everyone agrees there's Tibetan Buddhism before Padmasambhava and Tibetan Buddhism after Padmasambhava. So that's the first. The second is Atisha Jodi Peldon Atisha. And uh, again, there's Tibetan Buddhism before him and Tibetan Buddhism after him. And then Sankapa is similarly um, important uh, in that way, in that he, again, traveled, he, I forget, I think 55 different monasteries, hermitages, retreat centers. He did three five-year retreats, gathered many, many lineages, and sort of clarified them. So we could say, so in Tibetan world, there's a very famous verse 
which quotes these three and almost quotes them as though they are reincarnations of one another, though I don't think many people think they are, but they, it's almost as though. So those three before and afters are equally important up to that time. Of course, there's been several very important ones after that. Now, Marpa Lotsawa said, before me, many people said enlightenment in one lifetime, but until now, I'm the only one who delivered. So he could say <laughs> he was uh, Jimi Hendrix of his time. <laughs> yes, uh, Angela? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically what like uh, Lamala uh, said. And uh, yeah, I think it's interesting three most important figures, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism or in Vajrayana. So Pama Sambhava, we can say the big and very dynamic yogi, you know, subduing the spirits and kind of like uh, sometimes I often tell people we have to make a Hollywood movie of uh, Pama Sambhava, you know, how he entered in Tibet and uh, how he kind of subdued the wild spirits and this and that. I think the way how his story kind of presented in Vajrayana is in a very dynamic way, you know. So then the, the tradition of uh, lay people, like yogic community and monastic community with Kanchin Shivato, you know, so he was invited by the Tibetan king, the, you know, the Dharma king. And then it's like uh, how he represented the tantric school and then Kanchin Shivato represented like sutra school. And then combine together, they are finding the Samya monastery. In any case, I think it's it's interesting. They made it very kind of uh, very dynamic and very functional. And then there are so many stories about Bama Samba, like all you know, magics and uh, power and very very dynamic, right? And then uh, when Atisha came to Tibet, so Atisha maybe thought like this tantric part is a little bit too much, you know, kind of like over practiced or over emphasized. And then he kind of cooled down that wave. Let's say Pama Sambhava created this tantric wave, was very dynamic, very powerful, very strong, very colorful. And that's why actually uh, Atisha focused more on the uh, sutra teachings and, you know, he didn't focus much on tantric teachings. <laughs> But then the interesting is his main disciple, John Tampa Jongne, stayed as a Genyan. You know, Genyan means more like uh, uh, he didn't, uh, uh, he was not completely ordained as a monk. So there's always a question, you know, why he wasn't ordained as a complete monk? Because Atisha, that was one of his main focus. And then people are saying, okay, if he stays as a yogi or lay person, then the other people, they can accept him, you know, because that time before him was so much a Nyingma movement and, you know, Pama Samba tradition and so on. So then they can see, okay, another yogi is representing the Tantra and Sutra together. It's kind of finding a balance. So some people are saying that. Some people are saying maybe that is his future vision, you know, because uh, Kadamba tradition cannot only transmit it by the monastic communities. So it had to go through the, you know, to, to the lay people too. So that's why for me, in a way, uh, I think maybe that prophecy part is true because now we see the Tibetan Buddhism is spread everywhere worldwide and many practitioners, especially the, you know, the Kadamba later is becoming Gilukpa. Many Gilukpa practitioners are lay people or yogis and yoginis. So here we have example, Lamala. <laughs> so I think maybe the prophecy part, it matches, you know, and uh, then, yeah, he kind of, um, uh, how do you say, emphasized on the kind of slowing down the path, you know, the Tantra, Bama Samba, I think it's the, the speedy path and, you know, lots of these things. And then I would say during the Je Tsungkaba, like uh, we, we know, you know, he was uh, one of the best uh, uh, Tibetan philosopher and probably, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, he was very smart and intelligent and, <laughs> and this. And um, 
So in your question, you talked about, uh, um, how do you say, Jet Tsongkhaba six yogas, but normally we do not uh, talk much about his six yogas because, you know, his uh, three main deities are De, De Sang Jusum, then Chok is Chakra Samara, and then Sang is Sang Du Guya Samaja, and then Jikche, you know, Jikche is the Yamantaka Tantra. So that's his main like deity focus. And then, of course, then he taught the teachings uh, in the Tantra. So mainly the two stages, creation stage and completion stage. So in this case, of course, three of those Tantras, they, they have lots of uh, focus and very detailed explanation about the uh, creation stage, Kerim. But then in the Zorim part, normally we call uh, Rimna. Rimna means the five stages, you know. So the isolation of body, isolation of speech, isolation of mind. So we call Wimbasum, Luchi Wimba, Ngaku Wimba, Yichi Wimba, Wimbasum. And then after that, there is illusory body and clear light. So those are called the five stages. And Jetsunkaba had a very strong focus on this because, you know, in his uh, commentary, he said those are also the, the Guya Samaja teachings are taught by uh, Nagarjuna. And uh, so, you know, he believed that Nagarjuna's main deity was Guya Samaja. And then in Guya Samaja, they don't use directly these uh, six yogas, you know. So normally we call Chutu, Chutu means six dharmas, and it, it goes more Rimna. Of course, when you put them together, when you put them together, basically practices are very similar, you know. But when we the title them, I think titles are a little bit different, right? So, for example, for me, when I learned the uh, uh, Yotoniti, when we received the teaching, Yotoniti, we have six yogas. And uh, when you study the six yoga or practice, and then through that, when you see the Rimna from uh, Guya Samaja Tantra, it's uh, very close. So in a way, you cannot really separate to saying, okay, this is part one of the five stages. This is, you know, the stage of the... Um, uh yeah the six yogas like that but i think in general speaking so jetsunkaba's this uh, rimna five stage of focus is very unique you know but then when we go to see the his tradition and he also says uh, he and his disciples they says that tradition is coming from marpa you know so marpa was another i think the the when the how do you say buddhism had like a kind of it's a golden times you know like when Bama Sambawa comes it's become very dynamic and then after there was Marpa it's becoming also very kind of active you know tantric way and then uh, so that tantra wave or the heat wave maybe cooled down by Atisha and then later Jetsongkaba we know he was very kind of academic and very philosophical and he was very kind of also careful, you know, how to transmit the teachings. And I think which is similar to today's like a college education or university education, right? You have to go through lots of trainings and studies and passing exams, this and that. So once everything is finished, okay, then you go to laboratory and then you do the experiments, you do research and you do practice, you know. So that's why Jetsunkaba's um, this part of you is really revolutionary of course he says he took these uh, views from sakaba tradition because many of his uh, main gurus are from Sakya tradition but uh, you know to creating his own school and to really emphasizing this kind of study academic and then once you have the very powerful theoretical ground understanding and then you can put into the practice so i think it, there is a kind of big shift, you know. I think also with these three great masters, and they really represent, you could say, three very important phases or almost renaissances, renaissance uh, waves in Central Asian culture. Um, basically, a problem emerged in Tibet during the early and mid 10th century, because Tibet went into sort of mass civil wars. And much of the many of the monasteries that had been established uh, following Shantarakshita and Padmasambhava, many of these were closed. In fact, we can't really tell how accurate the 
the stories are that historians tell because they're all working for kings and you have to tell what the king wants. <laughs> but according to the story, like they didn't even have enough monks left to to uh, make a monastery. They had to borrow one from, from China just to reestablish the Sangha. I think for me, Padmasambhava's main issue our main contribution, main greatness was before Padmasambhava, going back to your guitar before Jimi Hendrix and guitar after Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> before Padmasambhava, there was no, uh, you could say, teacher training college in Tibet. Every, Sangsen Gampo had built 108 temples and monasteries. So when I was in Semye, maybe, 40 years ago, one of my early visits, uh, Abbott said to me, uh, sometimes uh, sometimes people call Semye a monastery. He said, not so gompa mare, not so chudere. The Padmasambhava's contribution with Semye wasn't that it was first Tibetan monastery. There were already hundreds of monasteries. Sangsen Gampo himself built 108 of them, including I think five of them were in modern day Bhutan, right? When uh, Bhutan was. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So Padmasambhava's and Shantarakshita's great contribution was until that time, all teachers were imported into Tibet from Nepal, India, Kashmir, Khotan, China, or Mongolia. They had no indigenous teacher training program. It's a little bit like some of these Dharma centers we see in the West where they always just bring a new Geshe or a new Kempo or a new Rinpoche from India and their own, their own students never graduate to full teacher status. So I think the great revolution of Padmasambhava um, beyond the mythologies and, you know, flying hair and doing this miracle hair, which is all very wonderful stuff. Everyone likes flying and everyone, <laughs> everyone likes miracles. But uh, historically, I think the big breakthrough was he uh, created Semye and more importantly, he created Chimpuk, the training ground where when you came out of Chimpuk, you were a fully qualified teacher yourself, a fully qualified master. And so his 25 disciples become, well, they're called the 25 Mahasiddhas Trubchen of Chimbu. They become the first indigenous Tibetan teachers in, that we know of in Tibetan history. So that started a wave of indigenous Tibetan Buddhism. Before that, either you're, if you're a Tibetan, your main lama, your main monk was from Khotan, Kashmir, Nepal, China, or India. So that was one. But then in the middle of the 10th century, some people say not, there's a little dispute over the, over the exact year, but the civil war that led to the closing of all the monasteries. And, uh, you know, they sort of make Lung Dharma sound a little bit rough. <laughs> makes monks and nuns have sex in public and stuff like that and closed all the monasteries. And uh, I think some of the monks went west and took some books with them and went up to the Silk Road and then crossed back east and came down to uh, Xinjiang, to Sangha, and planted th each of the three monks, I think, and they planted each a tree. And perhaps M. Jila has seen those three trees in Xinjiang. And Tibetans still go there and put... so. Anyways, they went back and uh, came back and started to rebuild. But because of that, everything in Tibet that had been created in by Padmasambhava and Shantarakshita at that time were a little bit, uh, you could say, uh, helter-skelter. Everything had been quite scattered and uh, just and oppressed by uh, the super government crackdown. <coughs> and... Uh, then, at that same time, that coincided with the Muslim invasions of India and all of this kind of new, all of the Indian masters, Buddhist masters running to the Himalayas to escape the, India, the Muslim invasions of India. And so suddenly you have dozens, perhaps even hundreds of new little schools of Tibetan Buddhism emerging. So, of course, the big ones we know, we know of Marpa going and coming back. We know of Re Chungpa going and coming back. And we know of, you know, various Sakya Lamas, Bari Lotsawa, and 
there's at least 30 or 40 or 50 Lotsawas who go and come back. Ra Lotsawa makes his own school. These all become their own little schools. So why is Atisha chosen rather than any of those others? Because for one reason or another, that period is always associated with Western Tibet and the Ngari area. And so that sort of become so Kargyupa takes their big inspiration from him through Gampopa. So Kadampa and Marpa get to get united, Milarepa get united through Gampopa, goes into Sakya. So then it becomes like a Sakya lineage. Then of course later, uh, Atisha goes to Semye and teaches in Semye. And if you're in Semye, they'll say, oh, you know, you know that uh, Atisha gave most of his secret tantric teachings only here in Semye. <laughs> So Semye claims to hold many of his secret tantric teachings. So he sort of became a symbol for that whole movement, you could say. And then after that, Buddhism had a total explosion all over Central Asia. I mean, a super, a, a super explosion. Tsongkhapa comes along 300 years later, and there's hundreds and hundreds of hermitages and practice retreat centers and training schools and so on. And Tibet, in my opinion, had not really settled into a sect conscious mode the way it became years later. And so when Tsongkhapa goes to Daichen Monastery, he doesn't say, I went to this monastery of this school. They don't think of it like that. And, you know, just Kargyupas. Now we say there were 12 Kargyupa schools. But I'll just That's only of of the Dakpo Kargyu. But in those days, I don't think anyone thought of them that way. You just went to a particular hermitage and you trained there. And so all of these had developed quite in, quite separately from one another because no internet, no telephones, <laughs> and all of that sort of thing. They'd all developed their own special, you could say, uh, ways of teaching and uh, transmitting and all of that. So then Lama Tsongkhapa mainly studied in about 50 uh, of the so-called Sarma movements and the Renaissance of the 11th century monasteries and about five Nyingma monasteries. When he got old, they said, all, all of the clarification you've done has mainly been on the new schools and you haven't done much of clarification of old schools. And he said, well, that's because I didn't live long enough. And uh, he says, but I'm going to come back in a future life. And what I did in this lifetime for all of the new movements, the, the 50 or 60 Renaissance schools from the 11th century, what I did for those, I'm going to do in Nyingma. So many people say he came back as Mipam, uh, Mipam Rinpoche. And uh, as Mipam Rinpoche, he did in Nyingma what Tsongkhapa had done for all of the new schools. So I think any, any one, one issue we have with understanding Tibetan Buddhism, I think is, uh, and how things to develop and unfold, is kind of the historical setting, you know, because often when we think of history, we think of it in a very concrete way, but it's more like little rivers flowing and waters blending and impacting each other in all kinds of ways. So if we were add a fourth to your Jimi Hendrix analysis, it would probably be Mipam. Uh, although, you know, you could say with Nyingma, if you, you can do that with any particular school, that same way before and after. You have to say Nyingma from the time of say, 200 years before Sungsen Gompo. And uh, we call that Bun because B Buddhism really, Sungsen Gompo didn't allow anyone before him to be called Buddhist. <laughs> They all have to be called Bun. <laughs> and he made the rule, you follow his Buddhism, his dictionary, his script, or it's off with your head. <laughs> there, there's many stories about that, right? These two nuns come from, from Khotan and they see a, a, a 10,000 heads on one side of the road and 10,000 bodies on the other side of the road and they panicked. <laughs> so he was a, we could say, before Sung Sen Gampo, Buddhism in Tibet, was what we think of as one of the bun movements. Tibetans use that word bun to mean any 
anything that existed in Central Asia, which was not Sang Sengampo Buddhism or Sang Sengampo descended Buddhism, Sang Sengampo, Tree Sanders and Tree Rapachan, those, those three greats. And we can go from them until Padmasambhava, Padmasambhava to um, Longchen Rabjampa. So Longchen Rabjampa does for Nyingma what Sangkapa did for all the Sarma schools, and they were actually contemporaries. And then we can go from him until later when we start with a very strong reliance on termas, about 150 to 200 years later, the, the terma tradition without Karma Lingpa, Pema Lingpa, all of the great Tertans uh, emerge. But uh, so I think when we think of these schools, we have to look at them in a more in a organic, historical unfolding way rather than often, often when I was, you know, when I first started studying uh, Tibetan Buddhism, I'd think, oh yeah, Kargyu, it's a very kind of specific kind of way but it's really a, an interaction of many different flowing uh, streams, you could say. Yeah, about uh, Samye Monastery, that's interesting because in Tibetan we call Tsugla Kang. Tsugla means the knowledge or study, Kang means the house. Actually, it sounds like an institute, you know. Tsugla Kang we can translate as an institute. Right. So right. Samye was a kind of institute because the also the architect is very interesting there's right. a, yeah yeah you know there is a college for yogis you know for ngakpa dundurling so that's that's especially for the yogis and then there's a dajurling that's especially for the <coughs> translation group and then there is this uh, samtanling that's uh, for zen you know zen monks and uh, so it's very interesting the way how they designed the sami as a as an institute or the you know cultural center, and mm -hmm. it was very very well organized. You know, very very well organized. There's yogic groups and translation groups, and even the Chan visitors. You know, Chinese Buddhist visitors, and all these things. And then, like Lama La was saying, the Jemba Nyirnga, the 25 master and disciples of Bama Sambhava from Chimpu. So that's the most qualified. Uh, uh, yeah, most qualified, like uh, his disciples. So it seems, yeah, that time kind of uh, that the, from the Samye, the place, I think it's everything was very well organized, you know, as we call it, uh, like five perfections, you know, and five perfections. First is ne pensum topa, means that's the location. <laughs> so the Samye was the location, you know, like Songtsing Gambo's time, the Lhasa was the location, right? And then they built the, the you know, Bodala and then the Jokang, the Buddha temple and all these things. So that's becoming the base of the, the development of Buddhism, Songtsing Gambo's time. And then plus this all other things he built, you know, the temples and monasteries. <laughs> so in Bama Sambhava's time, the Samye was the, the main center. And then also, the Atisha's time, you know, he had the Dromal Hakan, the Tara, uh, the Tara Temple, and then the Rejong Monastery. So that was the perfect location. And similar way, and uh, Je Tsongkhapa, of course, built a Gandan Monastery. And then later, the branches, Sera and Jepong, you know, it's becoming very huge and important the monasteries. So I think it's, it is interesting to see these five perfections, you know. The perfect mm -hmm. locations always played a very important role, you know. And then, of course, perfect the masters, like, uh, yeah, uh, this great, yeah, Milari, not, not Milari, sorry, Pama Sambhava and uh, J. Tsungkaba and Atisha, those are masters. And then the perfect Korpinsum uh, Tsokpa, retinues or disciples, of course, they all had really qualified the disciples. And then Chopin Sumtopa is the perfect, the Dharma is what the teaching they gave, you know. Like Lama La was saying, you know, we cannot make uh, schools. Oh, this school is specialized for this, and that school is this. It's not something completely separated, which is very similar, like today's uh, psychology, right? So in our psychology, we have uh, Sigmund Freud style, you know, some people, they like it, some people criticize, but he had his view, you know, he, he, he started his school. And then the Jungian and Jungian made his Jung psychology, 
So that's that's his way. But Jung studied with uh, Sigmund Freud, and uh, you know, he was his teacher. But later they had different views. So that's why, you know, there were there are two. They founded two different schools, which is. I think in the Western psychology movement, it's very similar, this Tibetan Buddhist school divisions, right? Then there's German, the Gestalt school, you know, it's it's his own way. And now today in the modern psychology, there are so many kinds of psychology. They're all talking about the human emotions, human <laughs> psychological problems, you know? What are the psychological problems and what are the causes and what are the solutions, right? more or less in the buddha dharma is exactly the same so when we say nang rigpa means the inner science right inner science or the study of internal dimension and so that referred to the psychological world or mental part so then different uh, masters and they presented in a different way you know of course then in a different style right yeah like lama la was saying Miller Ripa, he learned everything in a very uh, experimental, ex, experimental way, you know, so we call it uh, uh, means ex experience, you learn things through experience, right, for example, you, you try to be a, a uh, you try to be a technician, so you learn all the technician by doing, and that's literally what Miller Ripa did, you know, he he practiced and practiced and practiced, receiving empowerment and practicing, 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 and he got that knowledge and he he understood everything through just putting in the practice. You know that's we call it the nyung til, and then his teachings are in the nyung til too. So all teachings are from experience. You know he's not saying oh you know I'm saying this because you know Buddha said so so because my teachings are connected with this sutra and that sutra and this and that. He's saying, I received from my teacher, Marpa, and then I practiced, and this is how I understood, and this is my experiences. And so we have this uh, name, you know, Nyung Til. I really like that. So Milaripa passed that way. And then, and for example, his Tummo teachings and six yogas, how the Milaripa he taught to uh, Gambopa, so it's not so much based on the text, you know, written text. It's more also we call it the nyenjul means oral teachings, right? It's not written in the text. It's more through the experiences and so on. So Gambopa received that. But then the good part is Gambopa was already very kind of educated monk, right? Because before he became a monk, he was actually a very good doctor. That's why his name was called the Takpo Laje, you know. He, he was born in a doctor family and in the young age, he was trained to become a very good doctor and he was married and having family, kids and this then later because of the disasters, especially the disease and he lost his family members and then he decided to become a monk. So he was already kind of very well educated young doctor become a monk and for him, to receive very academic education was very easy, right? So then he received all Gadamba teachings from his teachers. But then he, when he met uh, Milaripa, he spent only one year with Milaripa. So this is a very interesting, you know. Of course, if you do the stu academic studies, one year is not enough, right? Like Jetsunkaba said, you have to study 15 to 20 years until you become a Geshe. <laughs> Once you become a Geshe and then you practice this and that, you know, so that's kind of the system. And so Milaripa, and he felt that connection and he knew that Gambopa was his uh, karmic disciple, right? So his intuition and his feeling, his karmic connection. And uh, then he gave the teachings organically, directly. And uh, then, but then Gampopa received the, the six yogas and these things. So Gampopa, I think Gampopa's mentality is already kind of scholar style. And now he said, okay, I have to write it down. You know, I have to write it down. I have to make it in a system. And this way the Dharma teaching can uh, can like, spread more or preserve better and this and that of course so milaripa you know the naked man and the, you know naked yogi stay in the cave you know it's it's the 
yeah, the organic nature, the organic transmission and experience and love, you know, kind of limitlessly, right? So I think, yeah, that's also very interesting how the these things coming. And then we had this Gampopa part, and then we have Chongbo Nanjur is the Shangba Garjul part, you know. So like Lama Lama was saying, he also visited Nepal and India, and he received uh, teachings from Nikuma, and then, you know, Sukha CD and all these experiences. So that part is interesting because then he had more like a female yogini teachers, you know, and this, and then they are becoming cardio. But later, I think, yeah, it's really like a psychology studies, you know, different masters, they focus in different aspect of human mind or human need. And then it's becoming like a different uh, school and practices. But when, when we really go back, right, what, uh, yeah, in the psychology, any school, if you talk, they're always talking about, uh, you know, what are the original cause of anxiety? What are the original cause of depression, <laughs> right? <laughs> what are the original cause of psychosis, you know? Why humans are this? Exactly the same thing, right? So we are talking about the liberation, you know, and liberation, we need to how do you say liberation is about liberating from suffering so what are the causes of suffering and uh, what are the suffering what are causes of suffering and what are solution for suffering so solution of suffering is the practice and then you go the creation uh, creation stage or completion stage and creation stage why you need to focus on chakra samvara chakra samvara why it's different than vajra yogini vajra yogini is why different uh, higher griva, higher griva is why, you know, so I think it's all like, uh, how do you say, the, um, the base is the same, but then the little bit of different focus. And then of course we call it a different lineage and traditions and so on. So yeah, that's why I was saying these five perfections, the perfect location, the perfect the masters, perfect the disciples, and perfect the subject or perfect the dharma, you know. So perfect the dharma is the, you know, different schools. There's a reason why the different schools developed, right? And then the, the good part of different school is different people can have different choice, choices, right? Some people can do very experiential part, you know. So, you know, let's say somebody is not that much academic. Okay, you learn the nyung chil you know, experiential one, or, or this, uh, how do you say, in the, in the practice, we have this devotional practices, you know, some people are not good for visualizing at all. And then you, you focus more on your devotion, right? Some people are very good for visualizing, then you focus on the visualization, you know, some people, they love chanting and this and that, and you focus on there. So that's why the good part of why there are many schools is the practitioners, we have uh, choices, right? So according mm -hmm. to our, you know, karma, our marriage, in the modern way, today's way of thinking is like we all have different mindsets. And, you know, we all can get our own, uh, how do you say, dishes, you know? I think that's the good part. But then the the side effect or the bad part of their many schools, then they used to have some conflicts, you know, then everybody says, okay, my school is the best, you know, the reasons are this and that. It's like, a, more or less, sometimes I say today, it's like companies, right? You know, the, the Samsung says, why Samsung's phone is the best? And of course, <laughs> Apple says, why I, I, iPhone is best? And now there's a Huawei. Huawei says, oh, we are the best. You know, the photo is better than this and that. Sometimes when we are too much to saying my school is the best, it goes that way too, you know. Then it can cause like conflicts and, you know, some problems and misunderstandings this and that and then i mean, uh, I, mean I i think and, his, historically there's always going to be yeah, some yeah. conflict there'll yeah, always yeah. be some but conflict. i think yeah in a way some conflict is good too you know <clears throat> yeah <laughs> until the lead until the lead a physical war you know there are some some conflicts the leading physical war i think that's really bad Beside that, because then when there's a conflict and it actually it refines their theory, their practice, right? It's not always kind of bad. Sometimes I think there's a good part. So then my last one, the, the perfection is the two pinsum tsukpa means the time. So that's why Pama Samba was time in eighth century. And then later, 
you know, 11th century and, uh, you know, the Atisha and then about 13th century, 13, 14 is Jetsun Kaba, you know, and so then different, I think different uh, times, you know, like humans are evolving and like different times, different uh, emotions or mental afflictions and this and that, and then people needed different practices too, right? So that's why also it goes according to time and people's mentality, and especially the therma, you know? So Lama La mentioned about the therma. I like that part too. Bama Sambhava, he, he says why we need different thermas because he said, uh, minam he said, actually, time is not changing. But people are changing in times, you know. So if, people's, if people are changing and they need a more different kind of practices. And so that's why there's some, you know, there, there's, a, I think, different teachings are coming in different times. So it has a connection with time too. So therefore, when we talk about uh, these five perfections and more or less, I think then we can understand, you know, all these, all these uh, things. Yeah. Let me ask yeah. something here. Go ahead, Glenn. I was just going <clears> to <throat> add something to the perfect place for Samye, Nepons and Sopa. And why did Trisang Dutsen choose Samye for the first indigenous Tibetan training, teacher training, or we should say master training, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist master training school? Why didn't he build it in Lhasa where he lived? or in Yarlung, where his ancestors had lived, or in Shigatse, which was halfway to Nepal, India. Why did he choose Semye as the perfect place? And I think it's got to do with the Tibetan idea of sacred geography. You know, when Sangseng Gampo uh, went from being the 30, was it the 32nd or 33rd king of the Yarlung dynasty, he moved the capital from Yarlung to Lhasa, because uh, basically Lhasa sat on the very center of the pilgrimages to east, going to China, to the north, going to Mongolia, to west, going to uh, Arabia, and to south, going to Nepal and India. So, but when they set up the indigenous training school of Semye, the Chude, or uh, say Sugla Kong, but uh, I think it was to draw students from those very important, all the important kingdoms of central Tibet. When we say central Tibet, it really means Lhasa, Yarlung, Dakbo, Gyeongse, Shigatse, and if we go north, it's Drikung, uh, Teardrum, uh, Retting, those kind of areas. So those are all little countries they you know tibet was not one country like a germany under a prime minister or something like that every valley had its own king its own gyalpo some of them even have what they call a gongma which means an emperor although his empire may may be very small like a few hundred <laughs> miles but uh, it was right set at the center of the standard safe travel routes going north, south, east, west. To get to Semye from Lhasa, you just travel east, cross the river, and you're at Semye. To get to Semye from Yarlung, you just come down Yarlung Valley and travel upriver a little bit in the direction of. To get there from Gyeongse, you just cross over by the, by the turquoise lake. To get there from Shigatse, you just come up along the river and drop there. So it was really intended as, I think, a place that would draw uh, trainees from uh, everywhere that that uh, um, Trisam Dutsen figured were the most important places spiritually and geographically. My good friend Keith Dowman in his translation likes to use the word sacred geography. <laughs> and I think the whole key to that period of Tibet is this wonderful idea they had of sacred geography. And I'm sure if uh, MG Dr. Nidala were to discuss his birthplace in, in Rebkong, he could come up with 40 or 50 sacred geography stories. Every Tibetan 
is just born and yeah we yeah. call we call Very sache good. yeah sache yeah. yeah sagi chapa sache it's like uh, yeah jom i think in english word maybe the translation is jomancy yeah. jo yeah. jo is earth mancy can be science or study jomancy so yeah, similar to uh, feng shui, Chinese feng shui, but it's more spiritual, you know. So yeah. exactly like Lama La was saying in the Sun Tsing Gambo's time. So why Sun Tsing Gambo choose the Lhasa as a capital and why he built the Jokang, the Buddha temple, you know, exactly there because according to the Sache study, the German Sea, so the, the land of Tibet was like a wild, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, sin mo, you know, while, while the lady is nature, <laughs> we should not say demonic lady. So then, and uh, then in the, according to that study, you know, her heart, the heart level is the Tulakan, Chokan. There was a little lake. And so they covered that with uh, earth and then they built the, the Buddha temple. So I'm saying like, uh, he's the kind of goal he want to bless Tibet, entire Tibet land as the kind of uh, Buddhist energy, you know, transmit that. So the lake actually is like the heart, right? When heart is pumping and then the blood, uh, you know, flows entire our body. So it's very interesting how he, how he de-imagined about this. Of course, he says, you know, that was the result of the, uh, the Wenten Gungju, the, he's a Chinese uh, wife, the Chinese wife, and the Tibetan Sache masters. And so I'm, I'm just sometimes is joking, you know, I'm saying it's similar, like energetically the injected in the heart, you know, in heart, mm -hmm. uh, Buddhist yeah. fluid. So <laughs> then it's kind of like the whole land is uh, blessed, you know. So mm -hmm. then they have this uh, 12 uh, temples and each 12 temples are built in each joint, right? Mm -hmm. You know, then the shoulder and the elbow and the wrist, so three and six, and then the hip, knee, and ankles all together mm -hmm. 12. So mm -hmm. we call it the Tandul Yandul Ki Tula Kang. Mm -hmm. And uh, two of them, the Tandul Yang, two of them, they are in Bhutan, and one is this uh, Chichul Hakan. I, I don't know if you have been there, uh, Steve. Chichul Hakan is in Baro. It's a very old uh, uh, temple, and you, you know, there is also very old. Uh, Buddha Shakyamuni's uh, uh, yeah, statue there. So that was actually the, her left ankle, actually, you know, left ankle in her in her joint, the foot. So, so Steve, yeah. Steve, you probably visited there on your recent trip to Bhutan because there's a wonderful statue of Dilgo Kenze Rinpoche in there. And uh, the former queen mother, so now I guess queen grandmother, great grandmother, built a little extension on there as a Dilgo Kenze residence. So whenever he was in Paro, he would stay there. So I expect uh, with Ian Baker and Michael Gregory, you will probably went and meditated there. The, the Kichu. Kichu literally means happy waters, named after the Lhasa River. It was an old yeah. name for the Lhasa River, but yeah, although, yeah. yeah. Mm. Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the one of those uh, 12 um, temples, you know. So that's why, yeah, this uh, Sache study is very interesting. It seems, uh, and actually Sache text says, you know, if you have a country, you do the Sache study, whole, you take whole country as your land and you study all together. And then there we call Samik. Samik means the secret spots, you know. Mm -hmm. And then where to build temples, where to build stupas and this and that. So you can do it for a whole country, you can do it for a region, you can do it for a village, and you can do for the temple and monasteries, and also you can do it individual uh, houses or homes. So yeah, yeah, of course, the, uh, the many things, yeah, in the ancient time, they did according to Sache, yeah. I once discussed Sache with uh, Gyawa Rinpoche, Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. And he said, whenever in Tibet, they would build a monastery or a temple retreat center like that. First, they do Sache, and then they do dream yoga. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So just Sache gives you like idea of which are the very powerful places, sacred geography places. But dream yoga uh, sort of gives indication of which one karmically will work best for the people of that time and that place. So he said, in Tibet, everyone 
all, all the temples are built on those two principles, Sache, the earth, the earth geomancy, mm -hmm. and uh, secondly, choosing from amongst the possibilities by means of dream yoga. So I'm sure there's stories like that with Samuel yes, as yes. well, but it's not uh, wasn't only the wasn't only the fact that it was perfectly located in terms of bringing students. There's also some indication that uh, Trishan Dutzen had put tax to get people to, to, so to fill up the Semier with some trainees. He had sort of put taxes, like a tax of one student. <laughs> so, so he'd say to you, Steve, Sung Sung Kaba, okay, Steve, I'm going to put a tax of one monk student. Give me one monk student. <laughs> And later that was copied by uh, Kublai Khan when he became uh, emperor of uh, United of the Central Asia. He built 1,250 monasteries. And again, he filled them by putting tax on, uh, monk tax on large families. You have to contribute one. You don't have to give money. You don't have to give work. You don't have to give service. Give one monk or one nun. <laughs> like that. You choose between monk or n money. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, you were going to say, bringing up another question before I interrupted. Sorry about that. Not at all. No, this is fascinating and wonderful exchange. Thank you both. I mentioned the six yogas in that um, in initial, uh, my initial intro there. And, you know, why do I bring that up? Well, of course, in our each of our solo interviews, we've, we've discussed the six yogas and both of you are known for teaching the six yogas and other associated practices uh, relatively publicly, relatively openly. Both of you are known for that. It's one of the reasons when we were putting this dialogue together that you know I was saying to both of you, oh, it'd be so, so interesting because you're both teaching quite openly. Um, that sort of, those kinds of practices. I'm curious then, we're talking here about this evolution of um, these great figures and the evolution of Buddhism in Tibet. It's so fascinating, these different Jimi Hendrixes, you could say. What about the six yogas itself? Where I'm going with this, I'm curious about if it changed during all of these revolutions that you've been discussing, or are we looking at the same six yogas now that we would have seen uh, back um, in, Milarepa, in Milarepa's time? Uh, what sort of changes were there? And the reason I ask that is, first of all, for historical interest and, and context, but also both of you now are teaching these techniques to people all around the world. Neither, of course, you're based in Italy, Glenn, in, in Canada, but both of you are internationally teaching these techniques. So I'm curious in what ways uh, you, you have chosen to present these techniques. How, what do you emphasize? What have you emphasized or de-emphasized in your presentations of those? I'm wondering if we might uh, compare notes on that. So <laughs> this is the sort of broad sweep, you could say, of my curiosity from the historical to what are you both doing now in the modern day? Right. Well, I would say, I'll just say something very briefly there and hand it over to M.G. Nidala. Um, I think before Tilopa and Naropa in India, most uh, lineages of transmission were, as uh, Enjinido said, based on the Rimkanga, the five, the Panjakrama coming from Nagarjuna, and these five stages of Tantra. And one would practice Guya Samaja, Chakra Samvara, Vajra Yogini, whatever one was practicing. But I think um, during the time of Tilopa, Gandapada, Sukha City, that whole period, the masters decided to take quintessential elements from all the different tantras and weave them together for easy practice. And it's like uh, M.G. Nido was saying, um, quoting Bama Sambhava, time is, uh, time is the same, but people change. So they basically, the six yogas of Naropa bring together elements from five principal highest yoga tantra systems from a completion stage practice. They're all completion stage, second stage, two more practices, and weave them together. 
Niguma does somewhat the same, although one or two of the tantras is different. Sukha Siddhi, a little bit the same. And we see others like uh, Siddharani Trupikyamo combines Hayagriva with Amitayas and so on. So that part kind of changes, right? Because of the changing times, those masters decided to do like that. And it comes to Tibet. Now, uh, what people practice for generation stage, the mandala practice seems to be open, like Marpa was He Vajra, was his favorite, but Milarepa seems to have preferred um, Chakra Samvara. And so these sort of, these sort of elements there, but from uh, Gompopa, he has four great disciples, right? And uh, he gives his hat to Pama Trukpa. So this sort of symbolizes the main responsibility for the lineage. Then Pama Trukpa has, I think, eight disciples. So it splits into those. It doesn't split. Lineages go to those and they're hundreds and hundreds of miles apart when they go back to their homeland and build a training ground. And so as with experience from those different lineages, they change uh, generation to generation, century to century. Uh, for instance, the uh, Drukpa Kargyu blends in a lot of Nyingma material. So if you look at the Drukpa Kargyu system of the of the Trulkor, the exercises, the Drukpa Kargyu brings in a lot of the Nyingma Trulkor. They don't keep it, the, they don't keep it Gampopa, uh, Pama Trukpa and so forth. They they add up, I think, 108. <laughs> they make it 108 Trukor. And so they all went in different ways. And I think the point of secrecy is in olden days, of course, every, in Tibet, everyone knew what everything was because you grew up in a valley and there's 500 people in your valley and your uncle does this and your grandfather did that. And so you would choose what you do based on some sort of karmic exposure, you could say. So when I started translating and writing and teaching in the West, I asked one of my great lamas, what about secrecy? And says, uh, Sangate rang sangre. The tantra is self-secret. If people don't have karma, they're not going to come. And if they come, even if they hear it, they won't understand. So the secret isn't lost. <laughs> So, because people in the West don't grow up around this stuff, we don't uh, make it like a connection with it. I'm sure if M.G. La spoke about his own childhood or Rebkong, there'd be a reason why he connected with a particular lineage and joined a particular, you know, training program and so on. And it's all very organic from childhood. But in the West, we don't have that. So, from my side, I prefer to, I think it's important to sort of throw things out there on the basis of their self-secret. And when they touch someone with whom they resonate, they will, they will find fertile soil. And certainly the six yogas of, uh, when we we're talking about schools, Tibetans have a saying, Lama Rere Chulogurere. Every Lama is his own sect. So I'm sure if we scratch Dr. Nida a few times, we'll find he probably has about 20 different lamas. And probably he's the only person on the planet who had those very precise <laughs> 20 or 25 different lamas. He becomes his own sect. And so that's the meaning of that Tibetan statement. We can say he's a Nyingma. He probably received various other lineages. His Kargyu, he probably received other lineages. His Sakya probably received other lineages as well. So in that way, everyone, I think, in our modern time where all the teachers are doing their best to sort of find the, find the new wave, you could say, of Dharma. And uh, it's in a transition stage, just as a, like it was in Tibet in the time of Padmasambhava or Atisham. Emjila. <laughs> lasso, lasso. Uh, yeah, I think, the, um, as I said, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, today we don't talk much, but t today we are all kind of very, because we are all civilized people, right? Educated people. So everybody knows education is important. And then there's kind of one way to go with education. Study, pass the exam, upgrade study pass the exam okay gradu graduated and then research and this and that you know so yeah in a way we think dharma that way too 
and uh, some schools they focused on this this uh, how do you say model too but then the other schools they are a little bit uh, uh, different right experiential like i said milaripa was very experiential and so that's why in the Karjul you can find this many experiential masters and uh, experiential uh how do you say uh, practitioners and so on right i think this is the reason why we call Nyenjul, you know, oral transmission. So, which is not based on the text and which is not uh, based on the quotations of Buddhas or sutras, right? It's based uh, purely like personal experience and uh, personal, you know, uh, receiving the very specific uh, instructions and so on. And so that means, of course, teachings can change and styles can change, right? If you say, okay, this is the, for example, when we read the Jetsunkaba's Ngarim, you know, the stage of Tantra. So probably this is one of the best uh, uh, text on uh, Vajrayana, you know, four Tantras, Kriya Tantra, Charya Tantra, Yoga Tantra, Anuttara Yoga Tantra. If you really want to know why they are called the Buddhist Tantras and what are the, you know, what are the stages and practices and how those practices are connected with the Buddha's teachings and why those things are not conf conflicting with other kind of sutra teachings. You have to study this Jetsunkabas, Ngaram Chemo, you know, Ngaram Chemo is the Tantra stage, right? Mm -hmm. And then because he goes in a very scholar style and he clarifies every point, okay? Why in this tantra says this and that, and which is matches to Buddha's teachings and the text. So he brings lots of quotations and he proved it, why this is a Buddhist tantra in a simple way, okay? And so this is, we call it a shet, sheltil actually. Sheltil means you give the teaching with a very precise explanation. So sometimes I say sheltil is a German style of teaching. One is one, two is two, three is three, four is four, five is five. So there's no, no confusion, <laughs> no discussion, right? And then Italian says, yes, five is five, but four plus one is five, two, or six or seven minus two is five, two. I'm just joking, you know, it's a way, you know, some says, okay, this is the, the system and this is tradition, you have to go this. But then this, uh, Nyamtil or the Nyongtil, it goes in a very kind of freestyle, right? So then I have two uh, two things to say. If it goes in the Nyongtil, in time, according to people's need, it can change or it will change, right? But according to this very systematic, very academic teachings, it can change but then sometimes we need to maybe change the quotations. It, it have to move in a little bit different way too, but I think that's a little bit more rigid. Do you understand? And uh, then we have this uh, tokshel. So tokshel means like a, a teaching for a general public, right? Then there's a lobshel. It means a specific teachings for very specific disciples, you see? So if we look in the Tantra or Tibetan Buddhism, the how, what is the system of the education? It's very different, right? But today, everybody have to think the modern way of education, you know, modern way of education, this is the normal way. Everybody have to go to school and educated and graduated, get a job, or make your business, right? So it's like kind of becoming a universal system. And some schools, they presented that system already. So I think it matches here too, you know? the people's mentality. But then the problem is, um, then the problem is, so I think that's the one very precise thing. So let's say like Nyingma and Karjul, we start from Mondo, preliminary practice or foundation, and then we enter real tantric practice, creation stage, Dzogrim, and then not Kerim, and then the completion stage, Dzogrim, and then in the Dzogrim, there is a to make a zorim, to make a zorim, you know, elaborated, elaborated completion stage or non-elaborated completion stage. So 
you see now i'm just really try to say systematic way there is a gondro you have to make your foundation right you have to finish your preliminary school and middle school whatever and then get him your college then you adore them, maybe your university, and then you do PhD, right? So there is a system. So the point is, everybody today is teaching, everybody does the mondro and the foundation. So there's lots of focus, and which is uh, really necessary, right? It's very important, all practitioners are grounded, you know? And then next one is uh, Guru Yoga or Gerim, the creation stage. So in this case, you know, Guru Yoga, can consider part of the creation stage and everybody goes in that part too right there's a, you know level one they do it level two do do it level three which one it's a dorm six yogas or five stages or six yogas right or according to kala chakra is a jyotu you know yanla two six uh, yeah six yogas or six branches yogas right so that one it's a secret. Okay, now you look at my fingers, right? That one is secret. And then they jump on Mahamudra or Zokpa Chembo. So that one is public. Do you understand? So it's like finger like this, you know, I'm missing the middle finger. This one, yes, important. This one, yes, important. This one is secret, but this one is public. So one stage is missing. Do you understand? So the way we say why the six yoga Zalong Tunkur is uh, secret, cannot teach publicly, it doesn't make sense, you know, in a very <laughs> mathematic way. In the system, it doesn't make much sense. Actually, Mahamudra is more secret than six yogas. Dzokpa Jimbo is uh, more important than six yogas. Why there are so many books that translated, Dzokpa Jimbo books that translated, you know, publicly everybody can read it, right? Why the great masters, they give Dopa Chimbo uh, Ati Yoga publicly. Same way, Mahamudra teachings, transmissions everywhere. When we come to six yogas, no, 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 that's secret. That's this and that. Do you understand? So in a really, how do you call it? Um, logic way, when we think this way, this way of thinking, it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense, but it's, it's coming from confusion. <laughs> right <laughs> so why we practice buddhism why we practice tantra the main goal is to remove the confusion but in this case why we are kind of really kind of uh, how do you say closing ourselves oh secret and it's not public this and that because that's coming from confusion right in this system you know it have to be gradual path one two three four if that makes sense, uh, of course, Lama La knows these things. I'm just explaining it to you, Steve. <laughs> so that's why for me, when we say Mahamudra is public and six yogas are secret, it doesn't make any sense. It's not logic at all. This is number one reason. And uh, number two, another reason why we should open up the six yogas, because uh, Today, six yogas, the one what we call it secret, secret, that's more referred to like Tummo practice, but then in Tummo practice is more connected with the uh, tulkur, you know, the exercises, physical exercises, right? Physical, you know, compared to the Indian sadhanas, you know, they are more steady, uh, you know, you just do a posture and you keep that posture, but Tibetan tulkurs we call magic will because it's very dynamic. But today, you know, we are saying just the mind, the mind, mind too much. Maybe for some people it doesn't work. Or maybe we are already using our mind too much, right? Even in the Buddhism, okay, you know, mind is important. Yes, mind is important. You know, meditation, shamatha, mind, uh, vipassana, mind. And, uh, you know, or any practices, visualization is mind. And, uh, you know, Get him, visualize your deity is mind. Uh, do guru yoga, it's mind, mind, mind. Then where is the body, right? Where is the body? So according to the shamatha and vipassana, it makes perfect sense, yes. Shamatha, mind training, abiding your mind, vipassana, analyzing the mind to see the nature of mind. It, it works perfectly, right? But we are talking about tantra, you know, tantrayana or vajrayana. 
So what tantra means? Tantra means body liberation. Tan means body. Tra means liberation. So liberation through the body. We cannot ignore the human body. With ignoring body, then how we do the, the non-purification breathing, right? We visualize, you know, we transform ourselves into the deities. We visualize channels, this and that. So why we visualize our body, right? Why we visualize our body? We use our body. Even if you say mindful breathing, you are breathing. Who is breathing? Your body is breathing. Mind try to be mindful, but main job is done by body. <laughs> so that's why I think we should have a very clear understanding. Tantra means body liberation. Mantra means mind liberation, right? So, and, you know, that's why if you really clearly see Tantra is a body liberation, we are not saying, okay, our body have to achieve rainbow body or, you know, disappearing or shrinking these things. But, you know, the path is the body, right? Liberation through the body. And so in this case, we have to use, if we use the body, then we have to use the channel, the energy and essential drops. And then these things, the channels are in this physical body. So in this case, you know, Sutra says, okay, physical body is the, the collection of the, the piles of dirty, dirty substances, right? The piles of uh, uh, dirty substances. And Tantra says, this is the this is the pure land right this is the the perfect pure pure land of 32 32 pure lands are based in our body our body is holding millions of countless or uh, millions of billions of dakas and dakinis we have a very different view right so tsa and the lung is the energy and the energy there's the karmic lung there's enlightened lung and then the tigle can be similar to hormones you know Right, so uh, that's why, according to Tantra, even the Tantra, we compare to modern medical science, there are many things are matching. Modern medical science saying hormones are important. Why it's important? You know, you release your dopamine because dopamine give you dopamine give you energy. It changes your mood. You know, it make you happy. It you feel balanced and you are motivated. Without a dopamine, you are depressed and you are you get stuck and this and that. Right. So then what is, the, uh, what is the way to release dopamine? There are many ways. And one of them is exercise. Walk, jogging, gym, this and that. So in this way, if you lose, okay, talong trunkur, exercise, exercise, at least scientifically we say, okay, releasing dopamine. And that, that, you know, that helps make energy flow, this and that, right? So that's why I think this is the number two. We cannot, we should not. You know, of course, if somebody says, oh, it's a secret, you are, you are, you have a Western mentality. Some Tibetans, they say, oh, you stay too much in the West. You think the, you know, Western way. I'm not thinking Western way, you know. I'm thinking in a logic way. You know, for myself, I was trained in the Gelugpa school and then Yingma school and then Tibetan medicine and then also receiving Karju teachings. I received many teachings. And uh, at end, as Buddha said, you know, as Buddha said, you know, the monks and scholars and practitioners, you have to use your head and you have to think carefully and it have to make sense, you know, for yourself and then you practice, right? So if I try to become a teacher and I want to teach because also, yeah, that doesn't matter why I teach. But then if I put these things a logic way, that's the thing. It's very simple. And... Uh, time you know and the people are changed in the past probably monks and yogis you know even you are in a cave you are very active you have to collect your wood you have to boil your tea you have to make your own food you have to go for begging food or this and that it's not like today you know you stay in the cave it's a comfort zone <laughs> somebody cook and deliver food and everything is good and i'm not moving i'm not meditating you're very active you are in the cave, you are very active in the nature, right? So today, the number one problem is sedentary lifestyle. And most of people sleeping, let's say seven, eight hours, so not moving, and then another eight hours of sitting. So which means 16, 17 hours of lying and sitting, right? Then we, we, then we go for a walk or we do, we travel, car, 
train, bus, flight, bicycle, <laughs> you see? So this kind of using really the human body is really luck. So that's why if we bring the exercise part and explaining about the physical importance of physical body and the tigle and the hormones, these things, I think that's the perfect, really kind of like a timely teaching, you know? So if I could add one little thing to what MC La has been saying, uh, uh, just to quote Gyawar Rinpoche, Dalai Lama, he once said, in sutra practice, which means ordinary, ordinary practice, sokshe, uh, generally we say the mind is like the horse and uh, the rest of your life, life like the cart, wherever the mind goes, the horse will go. So the approach of sutra training, everything in sutra training is put emphasis on the mind. And uh, that becomes the spear, the tip of the spear of our enlightenment approach, you could say. Then Gyawa Rinpoche went on to say, but in Tantra, the body is more important than, than the mind. And why is that? Because as we look at like uh, any high, any, uh, Zogram teaching of any of highest yoga tantras, it always explains we have three levels of the body and that gives rise to three levels of the mind. And so on one level of the body, it's just our senses and our muscles and bones and this sort of thing. And we see things and smell things and taste and hair and whatnot. And that gives rise to semrakpa, Tibetans call it, a sort of a coarse vibration, consciousness vibration. But behind all of that, secretly, is the, the, the subtle body, Lutramo. And that's really referring, as M. G. La said, to the Salong Tigle, to the inner, the modern words they use in neuro neurology is psychoneuroimmunology system. <laughs> But it just means your brain is developing subtle chemistry. And that's a physical thing, and it's affecting your mind. Your thyroid is generating physical chemistry. That's affecting your mind. And so on. Uh, so all of your vital vessel organs are basically chemical factories. And you can be looking at a mountain, a beautiful mountain, the most beautiful mountain in the world, Mount Kailash. <laughs> but uh, you've got the most perfect outer setting in Semrakpa, the, 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 the coarse body experience and the coarse mind experience should be very perfect. But inside, if the Salong Tigle is out, then the whole thing falls apart. And so for that reason, in completion stage yoga, they put a big emphasis on working on the Salong Tigle on the inner subtle body. And more subtle than that is, of course, just mind and the mind's memories or Karligi Paksha, karmic instincts, those representing the most subtle level. And again, outer can be perfect, perhaps subtle can be perfect. But if that very subtle level of mind and energy is out of balance, again, you have a problem. So Dalai Lama's point, Gyal Rinpoche's point, is that in Sutra, we sort of approach the mind and have this sort of, in, in psychology, they call it a trickle down effect on the rest of your body coming from the mind, right? In Tantra, you take it the other way around and impact the mind from the point of view of the support of the mind consciousness arises from the flowing energies and the abiding drops. That sort of statement is there. So we could say in general, Sutra is more mind-based, Tantra is more body-based, but a subtle body. And we see that in the empowerment process. When you take, even if it's a, a, a Kriya Tantra, and you take a Kusung Tuk, uh, Trinle Yundang Yijenang, you take these empowerments or blessings, the first one you take is of the body, not of the mind. Actually, when you achieve enlightenment, first your mind becomes dharmakaya, and then the other kayas form, ma manifest. <laughs> but when we practice, you first put emphasis on the body. So if it's highest yoga tantra, first you have the, have the bumwang, the, the, 
the so-called vase empowerment with the five of the trainee of the five Buddha families and of the master with the Vajra Dada empowerment and then the appendages. But that's all body-based, transforming the sense of the body, transforming, uh, releasing negative energies associated with the body, and transforming the sense of body into a, as M. Jila was saying, a Buddha field with millions and billions of dakas, dakinis, and so forth. So I think for us in the West, this is really the perfect time for Tantra. You know, these In the West, we have a very body-based culture. And if you turn on TV and they're advertising a car, they'll sit a very beautiful, sexy looking lady on the car. And the suggestion is, you know, this car is a beautiful thing. The lady's a beautiful thing physically. It's not talking about the, the lady's intelligence or the car's intelligence. <laughs> it's talking about physical, physical beauty in that same way. Uh, that pervades our whole, our whole society, doesn't it? So I think Tantra is really the ideal antidote to kind of the rank, coarse, gross materialism of our physical uh, secularism in the West, because we're, we're totally dominated by the wonders of physicality. But Tantra shows us how to approach enlightenment from the point of view of physicality through these three signs, Rakpa, Tramo, Shinto, Tramo, like that. So I just wanted to add that little bit uh, to M.G. Law's statement. And Steve, I think we have to wrap up in about 15 or 20 minutes because, uh, well, the thing is, when it comes to Tantra, Buddha taught many tens of thousands of them. <laughs> <laughs> so a discussion on Tantra, and uh, Tantra is not just since the time of Buddha. You know, every Tantra says hundred thousand million trillion years ago, and like that. So there's, oh, it could go on for many hours. But let's try to wrap it up and say fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes, something like that. Is that okay, Angela? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I That's mean, it's called I... uh, more than time pressure. So we need uh, to practice Kala Chakra. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Lama. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah, I think today, like Lama said, the more the Western culture, but I think now it's a global culture. You know, mm -hmm. this influence of the Western, it's it's the same, right? Everywhere, e even mm -hmm. in Asia, you know. Yeah. But I think, yeah, certainly in, in the modern times, it's emphasized very much, but. For everyone, everywhere, in every time and situation, we have these three levels of physicality happening, sort of like different, like we're three different people on three different dimensions almost. Yeah, yeah. But these are always interplaying with one another. So Tantra puts the emphasis on transforming the building blocks of experience, which is the, the physical side of things. Yeah, well, this has been so fascinating and uh, great. Thank you both for being so generous with your time and also collegial um, in this discussion. You know, we are, I think you're right uh, to bring this to an end. And uh, let's do that in, in that case. I'm wondering if there are any, now, you know, we're coming to an end here. If there are any closing remarks that either of you want to make, anything that's still left that you'd like to say that doesn't have to be, um, if there is, then... I think this would be a great time to to offer those. Angela, <laughs> you're first. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I think from my side, you know, today Buddhism today in the West. I often mention this. Buddha said his dharma will last five thousand years. So we should all feel that we're in this for the long run. It's not a short term th situation. We're in this for the long run. And he said every 500 years is a different character, a different quality. And then in the Lankavatara Sutra, Buddha says 2,500 years after my passing, my land will go to the land of the red-faced people. And uh, that, uh, so Buddha said that in Lankavatara Sutra, and that was celebrated in India in 1956. So that was the official breaking point of the new 
a 500 year period. So those of us born in this period were at a, from point of view of enlightenment transmission, were at a very important part of history. What happens, how we handle things will impact the flow of enlightenment tradition around the world. When I discussed this prophecy with Dalai Lama, he said, well, we Tibetans thought red-faced people, that must mean Tibetans, because uh, we always put that red rouge on our face. And then he said, then when I started meeting Western people, I said, oh, it must be red Indians, like Amer North American natives. He says, but no, for us, it really means the white people, uh, Mirik Karpo, because when they come to Tibet and they walk in the mountains, they just turn total red within a day. And also, whenever they get angry, they turn completely red. <laughs> and so, um, and I was translating a, a, a Dharma talk he gave in 1963 to a group of something like 500 lamas in Saranath. So 1963, this is very early after they were in India. And Dalai Lama said to them, we have this prophecy from Lankavatara Sutra, 2,500 years after my death, my land will go. He says, this refers to the West and all of you should start learning some English, all of you Kempos and Rinpoches and Geshes and uh, get ready because you're going to be needed. Your, your teaching services will be required around the planet. And this, I was speaking to this one Lama friend of mine many years later. So he was he was at that talk in 1963, and I was on a teaching tour in Spain. I think it was 1991, and uh, he mentioned this. And he said at that time all of us were just started laughing into our robes because we couldn't see how could we, you know, mountain people from Tibet with this old culture become important teaching where people with escalators and jet planes and all of these things. So he said, very few of us learned any foreign language. And, um, and then 30 years later, I'm sent to Spain to teach in Spain and I forgot to learn any Western language. So now I have to come with a translator. <laughs> so the 1956 was the beginning of this new age Buddhism, you could say, the international wave. And if we look at Tibet, um, Buddhism historically, it works like that. The first 500 years is one way, then comes Nagarjuna, then it's a whole new wave. And then comes, you know, people like Padmasambhava and uh, this whole new wave and everything goes to Tibet and like that and around the world. And, then everything sort of becomes provincialized around Asia, Buddhism and India. So we can see this 500 wave thing happening very precisely. And that 1956 meeting was the first time in the history of planet Earth that Buddhist masters from every important Buddhist country met in one place. And they met in, in uh, Doji Den, Bhat Gaya, at the invitation of Nehru. And at that time, Bodhgaya was just a sleepy little town with almost nothing. And all of the great lamas were there and great Zen masters and uh, the Thai masters and so on. And that was that began the revival of Bodhgaya, which is the, the, well, the Jemlingi, Jem, Jemling, Jemlingi Sawa, the, the very navel of the enlightenment energy of the planet. If you go back now, 60 years later, rather than two tiny little temples and nothing, the, 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 the main stupa completely in disrepair and just kind of there. Now it's like a, almost like a Disneyland of enlightened temples. I mean, every Lama has his uh, temple there and there's hundreds of them and thousands of pilgrims come in from all over the world and they've an airport just to bring in enlightenment seekers. So we can see this 1956 prophecy coming and land of the red people, Emshila, he was probably too young to be there in 1963, but he went and learned some English and some Italian. So he's like satisfying the, the is uh, fulfilling the command of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Lamas should be learning Western languages. When Dalai Lama said that, there was not a single Tibetan Buddhist center in America or Europe. And uh, I think in 1995, I was at a conference. There was a thousand Tibetan Buddhist centers in America and about 800 in Europe. And that's in 40 years. So I think when we look at this period of history where that we're at this 
whole new flowering. The seeds of Tibet were thrown all over the world of Tibetan wisdom, Himalayan wisdom, Alta Alta Himalayan wisdom, Tantric Buddhist wisdom, or Triyana wisdom, whatever one wants. And we get to play a very small part in it. So I think that's on the positive side. On the negative side, uh, most Tibetan lamas suffer from uh, refugee displaced syndrome. <laughs> I would say, in other words, their main emphasis becomes preservation of their lineage, preservation of their school, preservation of the sect. So there's quite a strong emphasis among 90% of Tibetan lamas to preserve their own school, their own sect. And not that they dis disrespect other schools or anything like that. There's a little bit of an unhealthy emphasis on that. And I, I mean, I could quote any of a hundred lamas from all different schools on little cent little things that happen. For instance, uh, one Karma Kargyu Lama, when uh, uh, one of his, one of the lamas who had, one Western student who had studied with many different schools said, oh yeah, we're opening a center and I'm, we've invited over blah, blah, Rinpoche to come and teach. And that, that Toku, he was a very high Karma Kargyu Lama. He went, ah, nor Jampare, that's all mare. That, that's a great mistake. That's not us. So I think there is, and I'm, I don't say this critically of lamas, you know, of Tibetans, because they're refugees. And my experience with Vietnamese refugees, Cambodian refugees, Laotian refugees, and uh, this kind of displaced refugee status that brings a kind of a little bit of an overemphasis on, on, uh, the, the self-preservation side of things has been a little bit, a little bit awkward, I think, and can damage the way Dharma unfolds in the West. So it's very wonderful to see people like uh, M.G. Nida, who teaches in an open way and teaches from many different schools, has lamas and teachers from different schools, and therefore teaches actual enlightenment rather than you know, this sect or that sect belong to this sect or that sect. So um, I just wanted to end by saying that little bit and to say great honor to be able to uh, meet M.G. La via Zoom. And uh, I've, I've seen many of his YouTube videos and uh, seen some of his books. In fact, I have his Karma Mudra book here. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> too, how is it? Old. How is it? My Karma Mudra book, how is it? I'm too old to practice it, but uh, I enjoy the reading. <laughs> Not that the book is okay, the text. Oh, it's, it's wonderfully done, wonderfully oh, done. Thank you, thank really, you. Really great work. But I've seen many of your videos and YouTube videos. and uh, so uh, With and my broken English. Well, yes, and my broken Tibetan. So whenever <laughs> we speak a foreign language, it's always a little bit uh, hesitant. Uh, your Tibetan is really good. But, your Tibetan but, uh, so, is very good. I'm impressed. You know, I've watched some of the YouTube videos and seminars you've done with my very, very dear friend, Bob Thurman, uh, ah, Tenzin, yes. and is one of the most brilliant, brilliant uh, Western Dharma teachers. So very wonderful. It's a great honor for me to meet you and share a few me words too. and Thank thoughts you. with you. Thank, you. Thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful Thank effort you. to fulfill Buddha's prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think that's uh, over, over, how do you say, overspoken. <laughs> and yeah, I, I start to learn English. Actually, I have to thank my uh, missionary teacher, you know. In Lhasa, there's few American missionaries, Christian missionaries, mm -hmm. and they start to give some uh, free classes in English. So mm -hmm. I felt, okay, I have to join it. And then, yeah. Then one day, you know, my English was, you know, very, very limited. And he said, he knew I, I'm a kind of a very strong Buddhist. He said, oh, I don't like Marpa. I said, why? He said, Marpa is a liar. I said, why you say Marpa is a liar? He said, because Marpa lied to Milarepa, you know. He said, oh, first he says, you have to build a temple here or castle here. And then one month later, he said, oh, no, I didn't say that, you know, you have to destroy it, build this. I said, well, you know, you see as a lie and we see as an education. Then I said, is Jesus a liar? He said, why? I said, is he a real son of God? 
<laughs> he said, of course. I said, how do you know? Mm -hmm. So that was a funny conversation. But, you know, I, yeah, I have to thank them, missionary, my English teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think my last word is, uh, I think, like Lamala was saying, you know, the, you know, the transmission is everybody is worried about their own schools and these things. I think everything is really like we are, you know, the we are, uh, how do you call it, the, the uh, civilized uh, century or civilized people uh, or educated people. I think the education, finding the balance with education is very important. You know, I know some, you know, Tibetan lamas or teachers, they're very, their mind is very narrow. They, they don't like anything from modern studies, this and that. And they really want to, you know, they have a pure heart. They want to preserve something, but without opening eyes or mind, maybe it doesn't so fit for the for the public, right? So we have to see like, okay, if you are a teacher, you are teaching, but you have to know to who you are teaching, right? You are not teaching to Tibetans. You are not teaching to Tibetan nomad people, you know, which they don't know how to read and write. And you are teaching to modern people and or I think some lamas they have to know you're teaching to the ladies, you know, not only the monks. Do you understand? So that's why I think this kind of uh, social awareness and basic understanding is very, very important. And another for me, what I think is, uh, as I said, in the Gelugpa tradition, if you become a monk, you know, you have to study 15 to 20 years, then you become a qualified the geshe and then you become a teacher and then you practice but we have to know that that is a monastic system and we bring the jetsunkaba's teaching and jetsunkaba's teaching for general public and general public they are modern people they are all busy they have all their families they have their you know jobs they have to they 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 worry about their paying rent and this and that they are super busy right so we cannot tell them okay you have to do like the ancient monks and nuns you know spend so much time to study this and that so that's why i think we have to find uh find the, the balance Maybe, you know, I know some uh, some cases, I'm sure the Lama Lai is already doing, you know, which things are the theoretical part, philosophical things, you need to be learned, right? As a lay person, without much uh, time pressure, without much uh, struggle, but basic things they have to learn and they have to understand. And then you put practice and then I think that that's more beneficial, you know? Then, you know, I know some people, they say, oh, we studied like 20, 30 years and, you know, we never went for the six yoga trainings and this and that. And then they fed up, they want to give up. I think it's a pity, right? And then also the other part, you know, the the nyanjul or oral transmission and then some maybe other um, teachers or gurus or lamas, they give very exper experiential teachers and then maybe they're against the education part, you know. I don't need to read books, don't study. This. I think that can be dangerous too because then there are people, you know, new age people, they say, oh, you know, I got enlightened. I receive empowerment, I get enlightened and now I can do anything. I'm free from karma, this and that. You see, they're kind of uh, maybe some people are having, I don't know, this... Uh, dissociation or delusional syndromes for them to receive this kind of teaching can be dangerous right so in that case maybe the master is master is not aware that to who transmitting the teachings so that's why this understanding about the mentality and finding the balance with the teaching as an education i think it's very very important and also what i always say is especially uh, young teachers and you know young tulkus or geshes i i wish they study a little bit more about modern psychology you know right it's not learning more modern psychology it helps them to have a better psychological state but if you learn modern psychology you can understand your disciples mind better <laughs> right you know otherwise uh, you know some people are they are suffering uh, like anxiety uh, and uh, the anxiety of death and you know this and that so when tibetan master they focus too much on the death this is impermanent you know this is so and 
you know, everybody will die. And if we really focus on the death too much, you know, some people, they get panic, you know, their symptoms get worse, right? So that's why I think the really the key point to preserve the teaching in future longer and to, to reach more people and to help more people, I think to finding a balanced way of transmitting is very, very important. And then as Lama La mentioned, like Bob Thurman and my friend and teacher, and then Lama La here, you know, Western people knows Western people's mentality, right? It's your culture, it's your language, you know, you know your people, like I, maybe I know better how Amdo people, they think, because I grew up in this culture. And uh, so these Western great teachers, they grew up in Western society, so they know their mentality already. So that's why I think maybe this kind of teachings we need more and more too, you know. When we talk about uh, food, so what is the best food is local and seasonal. So then we talk about teachers, what's the best teacher should be the timely and the local because locals, you know, the mentalities and you are more close, right? So this is, <laughs> yeah, this is my feeling. <laughs> Sometimes I try to talk to, to Westerners. I think they get me, but I know they don't get me. So that's why I'm saying you guys have said exact the same language similar mentality so your transmission is more powerful than others you know this is a reality so that's why i think you know also it's very important yeah there will be more uh, local teachers and maybe we need to find also the the balance of the gender you know most the teachers are male teachers you know i wish there will be more female teachers because more Dharma students are female Dharma students. Is that the, the, the your case, Lamala? You have more female students, more yoginis than yogis? <laughs> I think in the West in general, with all Buddhist centers in the West, there's about five or 10 strong female practitioners to every one or two strong <laughs> yeah. male practitioners. I think in, in Asia, it's becoming the same. Yeah, in China, it's the same. Hmm. And once I was there, I just gave a short talk and one man said, oh, I'm very happy with this group. I said, why? He said, normally I go to Dharma talks, they're all women, but here they're mostly men. <laughs> he, he was very excited. Yeah. So that's why, again, you know, I think women teaching, you know, the women lamas or teachers, if they teach maybe, you know, women, they know about what's the experience being pregnant and being a mother, you know. And being this very, com you know, into the complications of relationship and being a single mother, this and that. If they say something from their experience, from their heart, maybe it's more suitable for other women disciples, you know. So that's why I think finding a balance is very important. I do uh, think if we, if we look at the Western uh, teachers right now, I think in America, there's probably two uh western female teachers for every one western male teacher so the ladies are getting their revenge yes <laughs> thank you both this was wonderful lama glenn mullen and dr nita chat sang thank you very much thank you thank you steve thank you lamala thank you Gawa dim yerda da, just a melon, a trip gearne, trow a chicken mala, a tesa, a cooper show, chancho some show, rubber chimbo, chimachiban, chicho, chiban yamba, maple, and onion country cooper show. Lasso to the chin, lasso, lasso. Thank you. Low the soul. Thank you. Oh, because you're in Italy. Ciao. Ciao, bello. Oh, Tashtele, Lamala, Tashtele, Tashtele. Oh, MG Chambola. I'm a Pala, I'm a Pala Kukam Zang. Kusu, Kusu, Debo, and Bah. Lion, Lion. Ali, Lasla. Tana Kong, Tana Kosu. Not Tanta Chitang, Korea, Mongolia, Nepal, Dana, 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 can I wrong Canada? La Captaining a Canada day. Ale last last the Sopo Kaola Shugula Sopo Ulambatar Ulambataranla. Can I choose all your big chiso in mare? Ah, chuso mare, not chuso, not chuso, carisegre, 
Zoom tang email. Ah, le 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 las las. Ah, cyber cyber chuso yo. Chingkor ro chingkor. Cyber la nga te sige chingkor sig tu lang chingkor. Tere tere tere. At los three di manda la te lu lang chingkor cyber re do. Lo kare long nga trucking ola. Em si la Korea la chicken on sa. Ting ma ting a draw in las las. Re 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 nga rong gi ke gyorpa ke rong sung gyorpa che pa in one hi. Ah, le las las las. Ah, kore nga Korea nga nga Korea la nga chusong ni som yore ini nga rong nga rong chusok se gi mare nga rong gi tropo tan lo ma konso chuso zoya. Ah, ke do. Tene che tong lo nga truk te sung gyorpa te one nga 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 las. ซึ่งงานเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียนเขียน
Right, 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 right. Yeah. Mm, oh, but jump on this, so come, so come, so you should come, so come, so you should already. Then some pull out your mare. Less, less. Then it trust on love your chogging mare. Sarah J, Sarah May, love your chogging mare. Give me a a second. You didn't get her no yore. Less, less, less. Then it turning on a kitchen, you have a wrong love to give me no chump on that's a yen a covet yen a sangue, carry sangue. Trouble to she jig jay young, um, gumpo chuck trouble kitchen love, you know, how cook him in the in young, I can't understand us. Trouble, you can't, yeah, 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 Come <laughs> to Mm, that's less, less. <laughs> Come to Nika, Darmsla Yomare, Tene Kong, Darmsla Pepare, Tene Kong, MG, Tanshenda, the Ningtegi, Wang Long T, Tes Nombare Segido. Now come to Rumche Tene, a Ningmachu Thomas, Nigu Chutruk. Ah, let's listen. Con Sheng Bakar Gula, Tumo Mayambe Chuluk. So Steve, are we boring you? No, I no. Think our, I think our interview is finished <laughs> <laughs> without asking questions. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.